Good evening. Good evening. I'm so happy to see so many people here this evening, and I have great news. Our speaker has arrived. <laughs> it was a long drive from New York City, and we appreciate so much uh, all of the work that she had to do to get here today. My name's Adam Roth. I'm the director of the Harrington School of Communication and Media at the University of Rhode Island and an associate dean in the College of Arts and Sciences. And I'm thrilled to welcome so many of our students, faculty, staff, administrators, community members, alumni, and friends of the University of Rhode Island to what marks the 12th annual Christian Amanpour Lecture in Journalism, a signature. Yep. This is a signature lecture series endowed by our distinguished alumna, Christiane Amanpour, that brings leading journalists to campus every year to deliver a public lecture and to engage with our community and, of course, with our students. This year, as you know, none other than Christiane Amanpour herself is here with us to deliver the lecture this evening. I'm warming them up for you, Christian. <laughs> so in, in between taping shows in London and New York City for both CNN and PBS, just last week interviewing Brad Pitt, this week the foreign minister of Iran, <laughs> a couple days ago picking up her 12th Emmy Award to add her 12th Emmy to add to her collection of accolades that include four Peabody Awards, an inaugural Television Academy Award, and nine honorary degrees, including, of course, one from the University of Rhode Island in 1995. So she's here with us tonight to deliver a lecture titled, Truthful, Not Neutral. A tagline that she uses to reflect her bold and courageous brand of journalism that has made her famous and a household name all across the world. And I'm so pleased you're all here tonight, and I also want to thank in planning for this event, as well as the grand opening of our new broadcast facility, which happens tomorrow, in which Christiane will be participating, I want to thank the strong, wonderful leadership at the University of Rhode Island, President David Dooley. <laughs> Provost Don DeHayes. I have a lot of thanks. We shouldn't clap after every person. <laughs> uh, the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, Jen Riley. You got to clap after that because that's my boss. Uh, also, the Harrington School leadership team, in particular, Associate Director Justin Wyatt, who has been intricately involved in planning this event, Manager of Broadcasting Services, Jeff Fallon, who's hiding behind the curtain managing the controls, Ann Salzarulo, Rebecca Santagata, our partners at the URI Foundation, Lil O'Rourke, Sarah Lobdell, Taylor Schwalbach, and their peers, Karen Sessio from the University Events Office, our publications team, the Ryan Center, and many other people who have helped to make tonight successful and tomorrow as well. But I'd especially also like to thank Richard and Jean Harrington, for whom the Harrington School is named, both <laughs> Both Richard and Jean Harrington are here with us tonight. Thank you for all of your support, your many contributions, your friendship, and of course, your unwavering commitment to advancing communication and media education here at the University of Rhode Island. I've heard it said before that some of the highest praise one might get in their professional career will come from your colleagues and your peers, those people who work with you the closest, who know you the best. And for that, I'm really excited that to deliver an introduction of our speaker this evening is Christiane's longtime friend and colleague, 
someone who has respected and admired her for very long across her entire career, a new friend of the Harrington Schools, and someone I'm sure you'll recognize too, and it's a surprise for Christiane, straight from CNN, Mr. Anderson Cooper. Hey everybody, I hope you're having a great evening. I'm very honored to introduce to you tonight a true giant in the world of journalism. There is simply no one else like Christian Amanpour. She's one of the most respected and award-winning journalists of our time, and I'm lucky to be able to call her both a colleague and a friend. I know at URI in the Harrington School of uh, Communications and Media, you think big, well, so does Christiane, and she's been doing that ever since going to school at URI and graduating summa cum laude in journalism. Christiane is brave and bold. She's relentless in her desire to find the truth and to hold those in power accountable. She started out at CNN, as you may know, on the foreign desk in Atlanta, but it wasn't long before her passion and her drive got her overseas as a correspondent. Through her coverage of the Gulf War and the war in Bosnia, she helped put CNN on the map. When I was just starting out as a correspondent for Channel One News in 1992, I'd catch glimpses of her in the field in Somalia and then later Sarajevo and Haiti and Zaire. She was always on the move, always interviewing presidents and prime ministers, but also always focusing on the human cost of conflicts. Sarajevo was an incredibly dangerous place to report from back then, and Christian covered the horrors of the war in Bosnia with an unrivaled passion. You could feel it through the camera. She brought the war in Bosnia into our living rooms and the living rooms of people around the world, and when many people wanted to look away, Christian helped keep world attention on what was happening. When I was offered a job by CNN in 2002, I couldn't believe I would actually get to work in the same network as Christian. It was an honor then, and it's an honor now. There isn't a major news story the past three decades that Christian hasn't reported on, often from the front lines. She's able to explain events that can often be overwhelming in their scope and complexity, and she brings a passion and a commitment that's unrivaled. A commitment to truth, to facts, to human rights, and in an age when journalists are being killed and labeled by some leaders as the enemy of the people, Christian stands tall. She knows firsthand what happens when leaders lie and when those lies go unchecked. Presidents and prime ministers, dictators and despots have bristled at her questioning, but she is not afraid to call them out, and it's what she continues to do every day at CNN. University of Rhode Island, please join me in welcoming to the stage the one and only Christian Amanpour. Thank you, everybody. Is this on? So you might want to know why I'm bringing my handbag up here. Um, I was given a badge um, about a week ago. Hashtag not the enemy, OK? <laughs> You might want to know why I'm wearing a woolly sweater in what is, after all, kind of just the end of an Indian summer. Well, because it is emblazoned with my philosophy. Be truthful, not neutral. So we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Um, Adam Roth, you really did really surprise me. Uh, I had zero idea that this was happening, obviously. I've just been in New York at headquarters, which has now moved from really lovely bucolic Columbus Circle overlooking Central Park to Hudson Yards, all the way down and almost into the uh, Hudson River. Very nice, though, shiny building. Um, and Anderson Cooper actually sits not too far from me, uh, on, but it's very difficult to navigate these, uh, the new building for me. So um, I didn't know anything about it. Yeah, you do. I think. Now, the, the truth is, it has to be said, that when Adam Roth was asking me about a speaker for this year, he sort of said, what do you think about Anderson Cooper? <laughs> and I'm like, there's no way. He has a show at 8, 8 p.m. He's not going to be able to. It's, you know, every two seconds there's something going on with Trump. He has to be on the air. And I just don't know whether I can, whether I can swing this. So I said, you know what? I just don't have, I said this to myself, I just don't have any time to really think about this. So I said, Adam, I'll come. That's why I'm here. And I'm here at the end of a week of, uh, of big interviews around the sort of annual pilgrimage by world leaders to New York for what's known as the United Nations General Assembly. So that is underway. It's wrapping up. And um, 
I was happy to be in the United States at a time when we could arrange this, this talk. So thanks, everybody, for coming out. Thanks for having me. President Dooley, it's great to see you. We had a wonderful chat about many things about the university and this school in London. Very nice. Um, great to see Bob Carruthers. Great, I don't know whether Tony Sylvia is in the audience, but I have, there you are, Tony Sylvia. Uh, this is where it all began for me. Uh, some people say to me, when they do interviews and this and that, did you always know you wanted to be a journalist? So I said, actually, no. It's not like when I was five years old, I wanted to be a journalist. I actually wanted to be a doctor when I was about 11 years old, and I could figure out, you know, that there was a road ahead. And then, I actually didn't do frightfully well in my high school exams. It's a whole complicated story, but the truth of the matter is, I was really smart. I just didn't do very well. <laughs> So I couldn't get into uh, medical school. So that resulted in me really sort of wandering around in the wilderness for a period of time, which happened to coincide with me going back home, which happened to be Iran. My father's Iranian, my mother is English. I was raised in Iran. I was educated there and in, in the UK for boarding school. And I went back to Iran, and what was happening in 1978, 1979, as I was you know, trying to figure out what the world might have in store for me, what I should do, what my purpose was. Now that I couldn't be a doctor or even a dentist, I failed that as well. <laughs> um, <laughs> what was I going to do? So I don't want to say I'm glad there was a revolution in my country because that would not be right. However, out of many, many upheavals and much sadness and violence and, and change, often for many people comes a light and a route and a path ahead. So for me, because I was old enough and interested enough, and I was in Iran from the beginning of the beginning, the beginning of the stirrings of the revolution, which was uh, in January 1978 when people started to go out on the streets, and then that continued for a whole nother year until February 1979 when the Ayatollah Khomeini came back, the Shah of Iran was overthrown, and everybody's lives were turned upside down. So I thought, wow, this has been really interesting to witness from, from the ground level, from really outside my door of my house. I just had to open the door and see martial law enacted on our streets, soldiers patrolling, AK-47s or the equivalent thereof, uh, guns in our face in a situation that I had never seen a gun before. I'd never seen a soldier stand sort of, you know, uh, in opposition to, to, our, to our lives. I'd certainly never heard from our veranda or the steps of the greenhouse at home in, in, in Tehran the sounds of the revolution and the proslit... Forget it. The revolution, <laughs> evangelism, if I could use that word, coming from the mosque. Ayatollah Khomeini's words were being broadcast on cassettes that were being smuggled back from his exile in France to Tehran, in defiance, obviously, of the regime. And yet, they were happening in the mosque, big, loudspeakers, and it went everywhere. And I have to say, it was scary. But it was something that really, really motivated me. I said, you know what? I want to tell these stories to the world. I want to be a journalist. I also was fascinated by the pictures. Not so much the television, because that really wasn't happening as much, but we, there were a lot of still pictures, a lot of still photography uh, documenting the revolution. When I was in Tehran, but also when I came out occasionally back and forth during that year uh, to, to, to be in England, to try again to figure out what I was going to do with the rest of my life before I solidified my thoughts on this profession. And why did I come to the United States and come to the University of Rhode Island? Not obvious. <laughs> I had no family, no friends, no people, you know, getting me into institutions and the lot. Um, <laughs> but I did believe that coming to America was vital 
in my pursuit of professional success and professional survival. We all hear abroad that if you have a dream, if you're willing to work hard, if you have a goal, America is the place where you can be rewarded. Now, this isn't just America in 1979. It's America in the context of Britain in 1979. As I said, I'd been, uh, I'd been between England and, and Tehran, and Britain was in the throes of a real sort of government dysfunction. There were minor strikes. There were massive rolling electricity strikes, electricity blackouts. There was all sorts of, you just felt that, that, that everything was gray and dark and there was no hope. And it was a really bad political, financial, um, economic, and, and employment time in, Iran, in, in, in Britain. Margaret Thatcher then came into office um, that spring and things started to turn around. But when I made my decision, it was a tough time. And so I wanted to come here. And I wanted to come to the East Coast because I knew that much, because I did have friends moving over to go to university, friends who went to, because they were, wanted to be architects or artists or whatever, went to RISD, other friends who went to Brown. I had friends um, in Boston and elsewhere. And I didn't know where to go. So I came here. <laughs> and I think I'm correct in saying that in the 36 plus years since I graduated, um, because I've been at CNN 36 years, so it's about 37 years since I graduated, um, you, you are right, it's a different place. It was a great place when I came, but it's an even greater place now. It has colleges and institutions and faculty and staff and presidents and students who have really put it so much more on the map than it was 37 years ago. But I was always proud to be here because I didn't have that weird Ivy League envy. I actually thought that this was a really important place to be and, and, and places like URI because I think it's really uh, vital to get a massive, wide, and diverse opportunity when it comes to learning, when it comes to your teachers, when it comes to your fellow students, when it comes to socioeconomic uh, backgrounds. And I can honestly say that a combination of my upbringing in Iran between a Catholic British mother and a Muslim Iranian father, um, my move over to Great Britain, and then my move here to Rhode Island, I think that these all whether I knew it at the time or not, were the fundamental building blocks that have sustained me through a very difficult and competitive, and in my case, very dangerous career. I chose the most difficult and dangerous part of this job. I'm not entirely sure why, but I just wanted to be a foreign correspondent. I'm not sure I knew what that entailed or what that meant, but I was really, really desperate to be doing that. And during my time here, I did the internships that we're meant to do, um, our class uh, with Tony, I think it was a broadcast journalism class, so I learned a little bit about the mechanics of a radio mic and, and the like, but not really, I don't really remember learning a huge amount about the techni technicalities of television. At the time after I graduated, I was very lucky to be um, employed for a few months by WJAR in Providence, where I had also done um, an internship for the last semester of my time here. And I have to say, again, a rock solid, indispensable piece of my education and my professional puzzle. WJAR was number one, and the, one of the reasons was because in the, I think it was a major storm, correct me if I'm wrong, but in like 76 or something like that, <laughs> there was some major storms. And WJAR had the technology that allowed that station to be able to run and gun, to go out there, to, to shoot the, the events and to bring them back and, and, and beat the competition hands down. By the time I got there in the early 80s, um, it was still riding high, it was still number one, and it had made a name for himself um, in this state, which at that time had a lot of underworld, shall we say. The underworld providing a brilliant tableau for investigative journalists. And I was, and, and is she here, Laurie White? I was, well, there you are. Um, 
the, the widow of a very close colleague, and I consider one of my mentors, Jim Terracani. So Jim took a bit of a punt on me as well. He said, okay, here's, here's this girl. She's really ambitious. She wants to do stuff. We can use her. Um, we'll send her out to do, you know, the, 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 the grunt work on the investigative team. And I just, I mean, can you imagine at, at my age and stage to have been given that opportunity with that team, the I team, which was the preeminent investigative journalist, uh, investigative team in the whole Eastern Seaboard and beyond. I mean, it was really phenomenal. Um, I do remember very clearly once um, uh, them miking me up and suggesting that I go out. To, I can't even remember exactly where it was, but it was outside Providence. It was sort of in the out there somewhere. I remember there was horses involved and some kind of uh, bad behavior. Um, <laughs> and I had to be mic'd up to see if, if I could get on the record, you know, incriminating conversations um, that could then be translated into an investigation and into a, you know, anti-corruption um, spotlight. I don't think I brought anything back. Um, but the good thing was that they didn't catch me with my mics and my, you know, <laughs> packs on me, but that always remains with me. Um, I was also for a while at that station, what they call an electronic graf graphics operator, which is a very fancy term for chirons. Um, those are the words that go under, you know, under here, if you've got a certain person um, there or the weather or whatever. And I remember my most humiliating times was actually getting, having to do the weather, and our weatherman was called Art. And, and he loved humiliating me. Every time I got the weather wrong or the cloud in the wrong place, so I said 60 degrees when it should have been 20 degrees or whatever it was, um, he called me out on the air. But this was all, you know, backbone building stuff, as they say in British boarding schools. <laughs> and then, thanks to WJAR, I went off to Atlanta, Georgia, and to CNN, and, and the conversation happened like this. Well, Christiane, you're foreign. <laughs> We've heard a lot of foreign and English accents on this new thing called CNN. One of our guys has gone down there as, as, as director, and maybe, maybe you can call them up and see if they have an entry-level job or whatever. So I did that. I called them up at JAR, and they, um, their, their recruitment process at the time was not what it is today. And they asked me 10 questions on the phone, one of which was, what is the capital of Iran? So I aced it. <laughs> I aced it, and I got the job. And I think I must have got all the other answers right, too, because they had me down. And um, so I go down there, and again, they wanted to hire me. And they had this thing called VJs, video journalists. That was the entry-level um, technician. But they didn't really have entry-level for editorial types. And I wanted to be an editorial type. I knew I didn't want to, and I, I'm not technical enough. I still am not. So I wanted to be a, a foreign correspondent, which meant editorial. So again, when I got there, the person who had recruited me basically said, again, Christiane, you're foreign, <laughs> and there's an, a vacancy on the foreign desk. So put you there, and I was thrilled. Um, I will say that my first boss was not a sympathetic person and didn't share in my galloping ambition and did everything that she could to actually tamp down my youthful spirit. But I was not to be tamped down. And I carried on regardless, even though I would be crying in secret in the bathroom, I carried on. And I came in weekends and sometimes night times to try to learn the other parts of what I needed to do to get off the desk and get into writing or producing and, and then eventually, hopefully, um, into the field and, and eventually, hopefully, as a reporter and then maybe to go abroad. So basically, that's what I did. And I know it's not very common these days. Many young people like to go, like to go this way rather than this way through an organization. I've been at CNN 36 years this month, and that's a long time. And I really loved it, and I, as, as I say, I'm not sure whether it's possible to do that these days, but I absolutely loved being part of the team that started on the bottom rung of the ladder and moved up 
and then gathered friends and, and team members and, and knowledge and just the whole team spirit. And I use that word a lot because in my profession, particularly when I went out into the field, if you are not conscious that you are part of a team, it doesn't work because television is not just about one person. It is about a team and teamwork and camaraderie and having each other's back and just knowing the environment in which you operate. And, and furthermore, when you move up from the bottom to the top, you learn everything. So nobody can say, oh, you got that because of somebody gave you a push or somebody liked the way you looked or whatever. You didn't trade on anything except for your ambition, your ability, and, and your knowledge, and, and capability, and competence. So it's all of this that I have achieved today, and why I'm standing here today, comes, I feel really good about it. I feel really, really good about it, because I feel like I've earned it, and I feel like I've earned it along with so many other people. And as Adam said, when I first started being a, or actually, actually, Anderson said. I remember when he came on board in 2002, it was just in the lead up to the, to the Iraq war. And then he became um, an anchor in 2003 during the Iraq war while we were all in Iraq. And I remember him being with other organizations when I was in Bosnia and he talked about Channel One and the like. Um, but 1990, when I got my very first job as a foreign correspondent, very shortly after I was named, and again, it was dead man's shoes. Again, it was just, you know, somebody didn't want to do the job. There was a vacancy. It was a, not a, a, you know, a prime spot. It was a bit of a hardship post. Um, and I said, I'll do it. And they didn't have anybody else, so I, I went. And guess what? A few months later, I went to uh, the, the first Gulf War. Saddam Hussein did me the great favor of invading Kuwait. And did CNN the great favor? I'm being facile. Obviously, it's not a good thing what he did. But it launched CNN internationally. Why? Because CNN had operated now for 10 years since Ted Turner um, in, uh, founded it in 1980, but mostly as a domestic newfangled thing, a cable news 24-7 thing. Imagine um, 40 years ago, I think it was, more than that, when it, um, when it started, now, Everybody is copying CNN. Everybody does 24-7. We, CNN, Ted Turner started it. But Ted Turner also started something that nobody else was doing, and that is um, international 24-7 news. And the first Gulf War made CNN a global phenomenon because it was the first time in our modern experience, and the first time ever, actually, that war in moving pictures and sound and stories and real life, real time negotiations um, came into everybody's living room for want of a, a cliche. It was in everybody's living room. If you think people are, uh, all of you are probably um, completely and utterly hooked to your social media, all the platforms you um, use as opposed to television these days because of the Trump experience since 2016, I think people are completely, you know, now addicted to information coming at them at warp speed all the time. It started with the first Gulf War, where people could not get enough of what CNN was bringing into their living rooms. And then the ability to be inside Baghdad and actually witness the launch of a war. And we were the only people who could because of a piece of technology that one of our producers, we call it a four wire, that one of our producers was able to keep. And the Iraqis who had thrown most organizations out, but kept CNN, not knowing about this technology and not knowing that CNN could broadcast live, but still kept CNN because they believed it was, one way or another, the conduit and their conduit to the outside world. But this four-wire allowed CNN to broadcast that war as it was happening live. And again, that changed the face of our news coverage, uh, not just here in the United States, but globally and CNN created a media revolution. And as I say, the world has not been the same since. Um, for me, I went from this huge, big, official war where you have armies against armies and hardware and guns and people wearing different uniforms and you understand who's the enemy, who's on which side, who's not, to Bosnia, which was exactly the opposite. Within about 
within about six months of the end of the Iraq war, the first Gulf war, the dissolution of the former Yugoslavia started, and I was immediately sent there. And that was a completely different animal. This was now a civil war that actually, as we know, is, was, a, was a building genocide, and we know that because of what the cases that were taken to the International Criminal Tribunal and the convictions and the new laws that were, that were enshrined um, to prevent that kind of genocide again. So for me, this was completely something that I now had to wrap my head around in a completely different way and affected me much, much more personally than, than certainly the first Gulf War and much more deeply. And, you know, I, I like to say, read my chest, even in this post-Me Too world. Don't be embarrassed. Read my chest. <laughs> be truthful, not neutral. Why? Because I learned that in Sarajevo, in Bosnia, in 1992 through 1996, when the war ended. And it came about because we were telling the truth. We were telling the stories of civilians, men, women, and children who were being brutalized, besieged in a city like Sarajevo or in all the other little villages, really, which is what Bosnia was, a collection of little villages and, and slightly bigger cities, all being besieged um, by the, Bo the Bosnian Serbs and their patrons, the Serbs, the Yugoslavs, who had the armor, who had the personnel, who had the agenda, and who wanted to ethnically cleanse parts of Bosnia to create a white nationalist Serb entity to carve off and attach as a greater Serbia. They thought this was their opportunity as the former Yugoslavia uh, was collapsing. The rest of the world, not the President of the United States, not the Prime Minister of Great Britain, not the President of France, none of our democratic leaders wanted to follow their international duty under the Geneva Conventions, which says when you see ethnic cleansing, genocide, deep violations of the most important international laws, you actually have to respond. That is what the Geneva Conventions are in the post-Nazi times. And we had never seen anything like this happen in Europe since the end of the, first, of the Second World War. And because our leaders didn't intervene, it went on and on and on. But because it happened in 20th century mass communications, 24-7, Technicolor, live, everybody was glued to it. And because at that time, our institutions, let's just take CNN, and I can say it about all the other television networks as well, the major networks. We didn't just do one story and blanket cover one story. We did all the important stories. For five years, let's say three to four years, Bosnia was the leading story around the world, in the United States, in Europe, and in the Muslim countries, because it was Muslim civilians, European Muslims who were being besieged and who were being slaughtered like animals in 1992, in a city, mind you, that had its former fame as the home of the 1984, I believe, Winter Olympics, Sarajevo. So because they didn't want to do anything about it and it went on and on, we were the storytellers and our networks recognized that these, this was a huge story and we were the A block every single day just about, unless something massive came and swept us out for a day. But for all those years, we were at the top of the news agenda. The, front page, above the fold, on most national and international newspapers, on the radio, wherever you looked, you saw this story. And what was happening, not just the blood that was being spilled, but the sense that the post-World War II order, led and created by the United States, and, and joined by, by allies, was not measuring up. That the collective security was being whittled away just in this little area called Bosnia in Europe for want of a little bit of toughness. This wasn't about a, a war that required an intervention like the, first, like the Gulf War. This was not about that at all, as we saw a few years later when Clinton did actually intervene. There were airstrikes. It lasted two weeks. It was over. He went with Richard Holbrook, created a peace process called the Dayton Peace Process, and to this day, peace reigns in Bosnia, and then they went to Kosovo, and peace came to Kosovo without the genocide that we had in Bosnia. 
So this I consider a success from our side, from, from the storytelling, and shows that you can scare yourself as, as a leader into taking no action when a little bit of action, standing up to the bully, actually can work. Not one single American or allied force was killed in anger in that entire, there were accidents, but nobody came across any uh, opposition from any force on the ground. No Americans, no Europeans. In the meantime, we were accused of having lost the plot. We were accused of having gone native. We were accused, and I particularly was accused, of um, favoring the Muslims, taking the Muslim side. And when I saw that in print, because it was written about me, quoting a colleague in the New York Times, I was shocked, I was upset, and I had to re-examine our golden rule, which is objectivity. It made me actually examine what, what I was doing and what we had to do as journalists. So I realized that actually what I had done was tell the truth. The truth was just one-sided and unpalatable. One side was the aggressor, the other side was the victims. Kids, I watched children as young as three, four, and five being sniped, deliberately targeted through the head. Women being slaughtered by, you know, 88 mil millimeter mortar shells as they went to collect water because, as I said, it was besieged. There was no connectivity with water or electricity during some of the most brutal winters in, in Europe. It was really terrible. But I suddenly realized that actually, you know what? Objectivity doesn't mean neutrality. Objectivity means getting all sides of the story, and sure enough, we crossed the lines at great personal da danger and risk. We went to get the story from the Bosnian Serbs. I interviewed them all the time, um, but I was mostly on the side, uh, in the location where the victims were, because that was where the story was, and that's what we do. And when you get all sides of the story, you're being objective. But when you then mistakenly believe that objectivity is neutrality, that means you start to try to create a false factual and false moral equivalence. And that, in these situations, becomes, if you do that, you are then a, an accomplice. And I knew there and then that I was not going to be an accomplice to genocide, ethnic cleansing, or any of those kinds of, of, of terrible violations of international humanitarian law and just basic humanity. So I kept going. And I said, no, this is about the truth. And so I've kept this slogan. This is a friend of mine who actually made this for me, and so I decided to wear it as a prop today. But I've kept it and kept true to it. And it's not just about genocide and the slaughter of human beings. It's about climate. What is the biggest issue in the world today? What is our most existential issue? It's climate. And what has the press done for decades when climate science has been irrefutable and known. Famous NASA scientists, I can list them, you all know them, you have a brilliant department here um, that deals with climate and oceans. This is one of the great schools when I have people who, <laughs> friends who want to know where to send their kids, I always say, go to the University of Rhode Island. They have a great oceanography department, they have great engineering, they have great journalism, but this is our issue, and if you want to learn about it, this is a great place to be. But roll back to the consequences of journalists, among others, who believed that their duty was to equate falsely 99% of the reality which is up here with the science, the empirical evidence, and a teeny, weeny, 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 weeny fraction of a percent of people who called deniers. For decades, people with powerful positions have been perpetrating that lie. And that is not objectivity. That is false moral equivalence, false factual equivalence, it is neutrality, and it gets us into where we are today, which is in a serious existential crisis. And I really, if I have one message, and one example that I would hope that I set, it is to be brave enough to tell the truth, because telling the truth as a reporter is so difficult, clearly, and so risky, and so unpopular that many like to go along to get along. And it's easier 
just to do what people expect of you. But our job is not to be liked and not to take the easy route. Our job is actually to do the really hard things because we've been given this extraordinary responsibility, this extraordinary platform, this extraordinary, when you consider how information and news are really the, 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 the global commodity right now, the broker of everything that everybody does. If we are in charge of this, if we're the practitioners with this, we have to really know what we're doing. We have to recognize what we see that's in front of our nose, in front of our eyes. Um, and we have to be able to call it out and call out the truth, no matter how difficult it is. Which leads me, I guess, to the final part of, of this lecture before we, do, before we do questions and I get to hear from you all. Today, well, throughout my career as a foreign correspondent, I told you I went to very dangerous places. I focused on Bosnia. Bosnia was the first place where journalists started to be deliberately targeted. In all the war wars that I had watched and read about and learned about at university, read all these biographies of great journalists from Peter Arnett to all the others who had done Vietnam and Central America and Beirut and, and all these other places, people who I envied and wanted to emulate. They were not, by and large, targeted deliberately. Most of the people who died, and many did, and many were wounded, were sadly caught in the crossfire. Famously, journalists for decades were considered the the, the indispensable interlocutor and interface for all sides. Everybody wanted to tell their story to the journalist because they know the power of journalism and the power of mass communications. And so they wanted to keep the journalists safe and healthy and on side. So they didn't go around firing at them and shooting them and slitting their throats like we saw after 9-11. Bosnia was the first place. Journalists were deliberately targeted. My own camerawoman, Margaret Moff, um, I wasn't in the car with her at the time. She was going down what we called Sniper Alley, which was a gauntlet that we raced and, and, and drove every day before we had armored cars, before there were helmets that, that you see, before there were bulletproof jackets. It took people, it took our colleagues' death to get that kind of equipment and help. Um, they deliberately targeted us and shelled us and knew where we were and and just didn't want the news out. They wanted to silence the messenger, and they did it incredibly well. And then exponentially worse, every war that we then went to cover became even worse and more difficult because those people had been able to get away with it. And if you look at the Committee to Protect Journalists, I'm an, I think I'm an honorary member now. I've been an honor, a member of the board for a long, long time. Um, every single year, their report basically sell, tells a sad story that journalists, the, the, the leading cause of death for journalists, whether they're American or foreign journalists who go to foreign countries or whether it's local journalists in those countries, the leading cause of death is deliberate. And as you know, that is a skewed version of death for the general population. Journalists are deliberately targeted, de deliberately killed, and that is their leading cause, that is our leading cause of death. Now, we face a different danger. And we're facing danger from within our own democratic, free, and independent societies. And we face a danger most especially from within the United States of America, which is, I learned it here, there's a First Amendment. I didn't know that before I came here. We don't have that in England. There is a constitutionally protected right for the freedom of expression, the freedom um, which journalists use for their, for their freedom and their, and their rights. And now, that is being heavily compromised by the President of the United States, by his associates in the administration, by members of his party in Congress, and deliberately emulated by those who anyway want to target us. So let me just read to you a soundbite that um, I used in my program today when I had to do the story of, as you can see, this um, rolling and breaking story about these, these impeachment proceedings today. Um, the acting director of the DNI um, was, on, was in Congress, Jeffrey Maguire, talking about the whistleblower. And we've seen, I don't know whether you've all seen it, but the redacted um, account by the whistleblower is out there, and it's pretty shocking. 
and this political drama that the world has been living for the last, you know, nearly three years now, continues. But when it comes to the press, David Nunez, ranking member of the House Intelligence Committee in his opening statement, among other things. I want to congratulate the Democrats on the rollout of their latest information warfare operation against the president and their extraordinary ability to once again enlist the mainstream media in their campaign. This operation began with media reports from the prime instigators of the Russian collusion hoax. So that is the opening statement in Congress beamed around the world. That's Blame the messenger, but today, which has always happened, by the way, it's always happened, blame the messenger, but today it takes on additional danger, additional gravity, and additional ability for those who would really do us harm and want to kill us, wound us, arrest us, imprison us, to take example, moral leadership from the President of the United States of America and members of his party. Um, the president has tweeted about fake news nearly 600 times since entering office. That's been used, as I said, by people like um, the leader of Hungary, Mr. Orban, who uses the democratic processes to, in fact, close down democracy. It's been used by non-democrats, such as Maduro, who I've interviewed in, in Venezuela, Duterte, who I want to interview in the Philippines. Um, Myanmar, in many, many places, they now use that as a blanket condemnation and delegitimization of the free and independent press whose only objective is to report without fear nor favor. And this is very bad, because what does that do? That doesn't just put us in danger. We know what we bought into. We know the risks that, we, that are inherent in the, in the profession that we've chosen to do. That actually puts all of you and the wider public in danger because it has a chilling effect. And it means that if this ratcheting up of threats, and very real threats, which are not just verbal but also physical, if this continues, that means fewer people are going to do this. That means fewer journalists are going to go to fewer important places that need bad stories uncovering. That means fewer journalists are going to put their lives on the line to investigate, like I learned from Jim Terracani, the most dangerous people in the world. Because guess what are the most targeted journalists right now? Investigative reporters, not war correspondents. Right now, it has shifted now to the new front line, which is investigative reporters, including reporters in many parts of the country, who, in many parts of the world, sorry, who report on the climate crisis and solutions and, and the necessity to expose those who are burning forests, who are doing all, all, the, all the other things that we know. So that has a chilling effect. It means that societies will be less informed if there are less journalists going out there. And that is happening. That coupled with a different issue, which is um, rollback in resources and the funding of certainly local news, but also quite a lot of the more expensive kinds of news, which involves traveling with teams and spending time and doing the research and, and bringing back the stories. Um, I interviewed today on my program a journalist for the New York Times by the name of Declan Walsh. Now, Declan Walsh, you may have read about. He wrote an op-ed just this week in the New York Times, following the op-ed that the publisher of the New York Times, A.G. Salzberger, wrote um, earlier this week. And basically, the story is this. He was the, the bureau chief in Cairo. Cairo, Egypt, which, as you know, is um, uh, under the, the governance of uh, an authoritarian by the name of Sisi, a guy that President Trump jokes is my favorite dictator. Um, Egypt is one of the most jailing of journalist countries in the world, including foreign correspondents and journalists. So Declan received a call, or his, his, his office at the New York Times received a call, which was described as a confidential call, in secret, by an American official, warning the New York Times that Declan might be in danger for the reporting he was doing uncovering corruption and, in fact, the death of a foreigner in Egypt, which others 
especially foreign diplomats, were blaming on the Egyptian authorities. This was two years ago. It's only just become public. Think about that for a second. The key word here is a confidential call from somebody within the US administration to the New York Times. It is totally accepted and normal practice for US State Department, US embassies, any US official, if they get wind that an American journalist or an American organization, no matter what it is, in whatever country, is in danger, they openly call and they say, we want to warn you that your employee is in danger, do something about it. So this guy told the New York Times, this official, that he needed not to be named because he was afraid that he would lose his job by warning a journalist working for an American news organization that his life was potentially in danger and that he might be arrested imminently. And that's because he operates within an American administration that doesn't care about our safety, much less our freedom to, to report the truth. This is really bad. I myself remember when I was, so long story short, Declan, who's actually Irish, then his boss quickly called the Irish embassy in Cairo, who quickly sent a couple of cars and diplomats, took him out of his hotel room, took him to the airport, waited to get on the plane until he was safely out of Egyptian airspace. That's what diplomats do for their citizens in no matter what country, no matter what profession their citizens are in. Not this time. I remember when I was in very, very big danger, which I hadn't really clocked, during the um, NATO bombardment of Yugoslavia around the Kosovo War. This was in 1999. And I was under threat, and I hadn't really realized the, the severity of it. But the Americans called, their, because they were persona non grata at that time in Serbia, and they called um, their allies on the ground, diplomats on the ground in, in, in uh, Belgrade, came, a Swedish diplomat came to my hotel room, banged on the door at four in the morning, put me in the car, drove me to the border, and I never went back. And he probably saved my life, actually. He probably saved my life because this guy, Arkan, who was one of these indicted war criminals, was actually after me. So this guy saved my life. So just to say, that is the situation that we are in right now. And I don't give in, and as you can see, none of my colleagues give in either. We believe in this profession. We believe, quite simply, that the right to a free press and to the truth is a fundamental human right. And it's a fundamental pillar of democracy and civil rights and civil society. And all our nations are poorer without a strong press. And there is a big backlash to what's going on. Thank you. I just need to make a housekeeping announcement. Adam Roth is coming back, and we're going to take a few questions. All right. Well, I know our audience has a lot of questions for Good. you. But to be fair to our students, yeah. I also solicited through social media early this week some questions from students, because I wanted to make sure they had an opportunity to ask Christian some questions, too. And we're going to start with that. I don't want to drop all my notes here. The first question that a student asked Christian is, what role do you think social media has played in affecting journalism today? Has it affected it negatively? Are we on the record? <laughs> we are being recorded. <laughs> um, I, you know, nothing good. I... <laughs> I, I, I divide social media and technology into two different things. So there's the technology and the platforms, which are great. The ability to get you know, so much information broadcast in so many different places at so many different times. The ability to be able to download it at will on all these different platforms. I think that's fantastic. But I think that social media, in a nutshell, has come to be used as a trolling operation, as a, a anonymous bullying in the public sphere, in the, in the commons, which should not be poisoned by the deliberate attempt to, to tamp down honest discussion. And what's happening is that it, it 
is preventing, I think, debate. And we are in the middle of some really very, very difficult and profound cultural, political, social, historical moments. And these require reasoned debate, or at least, at least debate. Nobody's saying everybody has to agree, but don't treat everybody like the enemy. So I guess I would say that, that, that you know, everything is so polarized that social media or not, people, even in families, if they're on different sides of a political argument, you know, they can be treated like the enemy. Social media exponentially makes that worse. I mean, much, much worse. Yeah. So we have microphones in the audiences. For those who have questions, we should have microphones to run to you. And we'd love to take some questions from you. Right over here. This is Bornstein. Hi, this is a personal question. Um, it's three parts. <laughs> of course. I I'm not sure about three parts. <laughs> How many languages do you speak? Okay. Have you ever had to do an interview in any other language except English? And when you first went on the air, did they, did they make you take uh, speech training for uh, your job? Th those are, good, those are good, questions. good questions. Okay, how many languages? I speak three properly and then a smattering of a couple of others. So I speak English fairly well, um, <laughs> Persian, okay. and French fluently. And then because I did Latin in school, and I know this sounds like it's red herring, but it's not. I did Latin in high school, and that has helped me understand and be able to navigate in other languages. So I, I understand bits of, you know, like Italian and Spanish and other stuff, and roots of words that are not even European languages, because that's what Latin does for you. And then because I speak Persian, I can understand uh, quite a lot of Arabic, because, you know, the two have been mixed with invasions and counter-invasions over the millennia. So I can understand uh, quite a lot. And that's where you take me to the, to, to the Far East, not one word. I am lost, <laughs> completely and utterly lost. Okay, interview in other language, no, because I work for an, an English language operation. So even if I've been able to speak another language with the interlocutor or the interviewee, whether it's French or Persian or whatever, I haven't done it. I mean, sometimes I speak inside, you know, maybe, maybe before, afterwards, or whatever, but not in front of the camera. And then, um, and then uh, did I have any speech lessons? No. I mean, I think my accent is somewhat characterized as mid-Atlantic. It's a bit English, it's a bit American, I, it, but it's not intended. I think I do try to say data instead of data, because... <laughs> Uh, and privacy instead of privacy when I'm in America, and elevator instead of lift. But apart from that, and, and I've, I've very, very, very stringently avoided the new inflection of language, which I, you know, I mean, I can't, I, I, might, I might fall into it, and I'll, I'll, I'll recognize it when I see it, but. <laughs> yes, right in the middle. Hi. Um, having worked on 24-7 news and seeing the effects of social media um, just in the world today, what thoughts do you have on our consumption of news and do you think it's at a healthy pace uh, relative to how should we be consuming it? Okay, so I don't think it's healthy. I think it's over the top. And I think people are expressing severe stress and mental health issues these days, which I never imagined could happen just by consuming what's happening to in our world. Our world has always been a really difficult place. Um, and there's also, there's always been dark, but also light. Today, it seems everybody's focused just on the dark and not on the light. They're not even seeing the backlash, the counter movements, whether it's in the press, as I said. We're fighting back. We will bring you the truth. You have, in, in terms of race, for instance, you've seen the backlash and the fight back against institutional racism. In terms of, um, uh, the gun violence, you've seen children and, and civil society fight back. So I think that is, the, all of these are, um, are, are really the, the light amidst this dark. But because it's coming at warp speed, all the dark, people can't seem to switch off. And because of social media or the devices that, that just do hook you and do addict you, they can't get off it. So people are 
going to bed with the blue light and the, and the information, waking up with it, um, and, and just living their lives in a total state of constant stress. And I don't think that's good because I don't think you can think your way out of your predicament if you're constantly being overwhelmed. And to be honest with you, I don't. I, I don't. I hate to say it. I'm not watching. I certainly don't do, I don't go on social media except for my work. Um, I don't, I don't, you know, have all these feeds and streams and I don't know what else to, you know, upset me. And My wife is looking at me with a dirty look yes. right now because I'm on my phone all the well, time. Well, you shouldn't be. It's bad for your health. And actually, by the way, by the way, I'm a strong believer in human interaction. I'm lucky that I was of the generation that, that still <laughs> operated In a human environment, in a hum I believe in looking people in the eyes, in talking to people. And I've just learned by, you know, I get to do a lot of great interviews on my show. Now that I've got this sort of new PBS-CNN hybrid, it, and it's an hour every night, five times a week, it allows me not just to do hard, scary news, but also cultural stuff, also, um, um, you know, sort of developments in all sorts of issues like mental health. I just interviewed somebody who may be well known to all of you, and um, she's a Yale professor. Her name is Dr. Lori Santos. And her class on happiness was the most oversubscribed class in the 300 plus history of Yale University. And now, and now, she has a podcast called The Happiness Lab. I recommend it to everybody. Everybody, but one of the things she says is that one of the reasons she thinks it was so um, popular and necessary on campus is because there's so much loneliness, so much, pe people are lost in many campuses, people don't know what to do and how to interact, and you know, there's all this stuff that's sort of going on. We know that there's a loneliness and mental health epidemics going on amongst our young, wherever they are. And that, that's, to me, something very important. I've just dropped my son off um, at his freshman year, and it's very important. And I've always, throughout, since he was born, I've been monitoring the impact of online and, and, and all the rest of it. But one of the things she says, and this goes to one of the questions you asked, how do you stay rational and up and optimistic? Um, she says that if you're just constantly looking down, you're not smiling. And if you smile, it makes you feel better. Not just people around you, but it makes you feel better. It's really simple. And I'm very happy and proud to say that I am a habitual interactor with people. <laughs> so if you'd like to ask a question, put your hand up. The microphones would come to you. And in the meantime, uh, we know you're not always interviewing leaders of foreign countries all over the world. You're doing a few other interesting things, too. And there, a question from a student was, we loved your series, Sex and Love Around the World. You know, I did, too. I let you know about that. Do you have any plans to do any more reporting like that? Well, I would like to do a follow-up on that, um, but actually through the eyes of, of, of boys and young men. Yes, because I think, I mean, you know, we've all been through this Me Too movement and this necessary and timely revolution and correction of, 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 of I, I mean, I don't even know how to describe it. These, these things that have been happening just because, you know, it's awful. Um, but boys have had nowhere to go to express their emotions, to express their masculinity, to understand and Im investigate what masculinity is and how it can also be vulnerable and how it doesn't always have to be, you know, chest beating and, 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 you know, patriarchy and all the rest of it. I think boys are brought up in all our worlds, you know, in all our societies um, to have a different, you know, what, modus vivendi when it comes to thinking what their role is in life. And so I would like to do that series through, um, through the eyes of boys. I think it would help boys and men and women, further help women. But I must say, when I came to my boss and said, I want to do this um, series on sex, they looked at me as if I was a nut job. <laughs> because when I said, no, I don't want to go and investigate, you know, all the normal things that we do, sex trafficking, prostitution, the illegal, dirty, seedy, underbelly, the victimization of women and girls and all that. I said, no, we do that already. That's the hard news. What I want to do is, is investigate, um, you know, the boundaries of intimacy, the boundaries of, of, of what it feels to be a human being. And in this case, I did it through the eyes of women mostly, um, in all sorts of different societies. I wanted to know what it 
felt or what it meant to be a young woman or a middle-aged woman or an older woman in, in India or in Beirut or in Tokyo or in Shanghai or in Ghana, all those places yeah. I went. You know, do you feel you have the right to demand intimacy and satisfaction, whether it's emotional, physical, sexual, whatever it is? Because, and I was, I mean, just to show you, I asked an Afghan refugee woman in Berlin, are you happy? Simple question. And I was told by my Afghan German translator that this is a very dangerous question to ask an Afghan woman. I nearly cried, but it's true. The idea, and this is why I wanted to do this series, because the idea that women in so many cultures feel that they have no right to be human beings and to want the most basic, basic of human emotion, contact, rights, that, that answer said it to me all, said it all to me, yeah. Absolutely. So people were very energized and they went on, on Netflix yeah. and it got, I got a whole new demographic audience and it was right. great. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. We have a question over here. Hi, oh my gosh. It's yes, man. Hi, um, it's just one question, I just took notes because, you know. Um, but in the beginning of your lecture, uh, you mentioned that you came to America because you felt that it was vital for the professionalist route um, and journey. Do you still believe that with the climate of our nation that it's still vital to come to America? Well, you know, you ask a very good question, and it brings up the whole immigrant experience, the refugee um, experience, the, the, the big issue that is facing this country and Britain with Brexit, other parts of Europe, other parts of the world. Um, you know, my faith has been a little bit rocked. I am one of those America lovers. I believe in the promise of this country. I believe in what it has, this exceptional, indispensable nation for all the rights and, and values that it has given to the world, and really given to the world. Um, but I think it's in very, very serious danger right now. I don't think it's in danger necessarily in each community, in each neighborhood, because I think people are people, and people still always amaze me by their goodness, by their generosity, by their um, good neighborliness, um, whether it's to strangers in their midst or, or, or whoever it might be. But I think when you have the overarching architecture of your system questioning the value of foreigners, which is what this is about, right? The other. We are in one of, the, one of the most acute moments of struggle between us and the other, or the other and us. The other is viewed as an alien. And, and this is a very dangerous and sad and un-American um, situation. So <clears throat> would I say, and would I recommend, maybe not 100% like I used to, but I would still recommend, because I still think this country has some of the greatest educational institutions, some of the greatest opportunities. Um, still, you know, most people uphold some of the greatest values. But I do believe that the atmosphere is being poisoned, and I do believe that we all, each and every one of us, every teacher, every doctor, every profession that you all are, whoever we are, every student, every child, every parent, has a duty to counter this every single day and every minute in their own homes. Please. Is there another question over here? You gave Thank it you. away. Never give up the mic. I got it. I have a two-part question. One of them has to do with the fact that it seems that so often we see breaking news, and I'm wondering how often it's actually breaking. <laughs> and and the, the second part of it has to do with coverage of the Trump administration, because there are so many different things that come out day after day after day, and some of the things that come out are very outrageous. Some of the things are moderately, I don't know, annoying or, or a little bit worse than that. And with the constant flow of all of that, do you think there's, uh, has there been actually any sort of culling of the, of the outrages to cover? 
you know, or should, I, or should there be? Because it, it'll bring on an overreaction from that side, possibly even playing into it. You know, I think part of the overcoverage is part of the angst that a lot of people are feeling and that I, that I addressed a, a moment ago. Look, if you ask me, there's too much. I don't run the networks. Um, I would much prefer to do, you know, to cover the important stuff. Uh, right now, we're in an important moment, obviously, when the Congress decides to formally proceed with impeachment proceedings. I think, I think it's only the third time in, in American presidential history. Uh, third or fourth? Fourth, fourth, maybe fourth, you're right. Um, yeah. I think that that is, uh, you know, something that we have to do. And by nature of being 24-7, and by nature of how all the cable networks have decided that we're just going to go one story heavy all the time, this has become the model. Now, I think it can have the opposite effect. In other words, it can have the, the effect of sort of just, you know, fatigue, news fatigue. And... Worse, dulling the sense of outrage, the, the, the real sense of outrage. Um, because each time something happens and we cover everything as if it was the same, then you basically say it's all the same and nothing needs to be singled out because it's all the same. Or worse, this outrage today gets forgotten because of tomorrow's outrage. And that's what everybody's doing. They're waiting for tomorrow's outrage. Um, and that applies in not just... Um, this administration, but in many, many other, whether it's the Brexit stuff, or, you know, I mean, stuff you just can't believe is happening. Whether what's happening in, in Hungary, whether what's the anti-democratic forces in Hungary or in Poland, and the things they do, like, you know, shutting down the independent judiciary, all that stuff, the stuff that we thought, you know, oh my God, if you go there, that's the third rail, you know, you, then you're really in trouble, but it's all happening, and they're still, doing it. So I think a little bit of a bit more sort of judicious culling and discrimination in terms of what we actually cover and, what, and, and the context around it. And I would like to see, because I, again, come from the generation that's not the talking head generation in terms of just standing in front of somewhere and, you know, opining or spouting the news. I believe in pictures and, and sound and going to get much more information from people in, you know, where they live, whether it's here or around the world. I think more of that would be very helpful, which is why you'll see that documentaries are a huge thing right now. People want to see long form. They want to hear from people on, on all sorts of issues, whether they're political or, or not. Um, you see that podcasts are a huge thing right now because you get to have more context, more time. You get to hear from you know, real people, what we used to call man on the street, vox pop, um, et cetera. So I think a little bit more of that would help round out this just, this just noise. Thank you. Can this lady please take the mic again? Yeah. While it's coming to her, we can go somewhere else, yeah. if you want. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so you mentioned beforehand about how you think the most exi existential threat of you know, modern times is climate change. And of course, that's something that my generation is going to have to deal with pretty extensively. Um, so Given that we still live in a country where 40% of the population, give or take, still believes that climate change is a myth, what do you think the, you know, the press and the news coverage could be doing to more effectively um, frame the issue? Well, first of all, it's a really good question, a really important question, and I think several things have happened. Um, to be honest with you, your generation has actually shifted the playing field and has moved the ball down that road. And it, whether it's Greta Thunberg or all the other people, young people, who are really standing up to be counted and just will not have and will not be palmed off with the same old, you know, platitudes or denials that, that everybody has in the past. I think that she has actually inspired a movement, or, or she's, she's allowed a movement to coalesce around her public advocacy. And it's everywhere. It's all over the world, these, these kids. Um, on Fridays, you know, bringing all sorts of cities to, to halts and, um, and also parliaments and the like. And that, in turn, is translated into votes at the ballot box. You saw what happened here in the midterms in 2018. Climate was a very, very big part of what motivated um, the flip of the, of the house. Um, of course, health and the others, but climate was named as a very big issue. We also know here that amongst 
um, young Republicans, particularly Republicans on, on, on campuses, um, millennial Republicans, the, the ball is shifting as well. And the percentage of believers and people who believe in the Republican Party of, of that generation, that change has to happen and that we are responsible, is, is increasing. That is really, really important. And um, I think, if I'm not mistaken, they're demanding that various elements of this be put in the next party's platform. And remember that by 2020, I've been told, um, the biggest voting block will be millennials, not baby boomers anymore. 2020 is when the millennials will be the biggest voting block. And I tell you one thing, people had better get out and vote. It is not okay. It is not okay. Now, I, I have been shocked my entire time living in America, shocked by the percentage of people who bother to go out and vote. I think it's an abomination. And frankly, people get the government and the policies that they vote or don't vote for. So people have to go out and vote. This is the only thing that distinguishes our societies from tin pot dictatorships and authoritarian um, uh, you know, r regimes who don't give a damn about what people think. And, and I really, really think it's just your basic responsibility to go out and vote. Um, and as for our responsibility on this issue of climate, we're doing it more and more now. We had a town hall um, meeting with the president of CNN in the London office a, a few months ago. And CNN's um, description, framing of this has shifted since then. We now call it a climate crisis. We don't just say climate change. We had, and this is big, CNN devoted eight hours to putting all the main candidates, Democratic candidates, on the stage to talk about the climate. Now, you might think that's just a vanity project or, or, a, or, a, or a gimmick or, or what, but it was eight hours in which all those people came out and talked about the, you know, the, their, their, their programs. And actually, it was really good. It was really, really good. So just to say the ball is moving, and in Europe, um, where there's been a number of deniers, but not as much. This is the only major democratic country that officially denies the existence of man-made climate change. The party, by the way, sorry. The current government. The only major Western democracy. Think about it. Not even China denies it. Not even India denies it. Um, but in Europe, in Europe, again, in the, well, our version of midterms, which were the European elections a um, few months ago, not immigration, which all the populist um, politicians were hoping to, to win seats on. It wasn't immigration. That was fourth or something down the line. It was climate and the environment. So I think this is moving. And thanks to your generation and the people who are younger than you. That's where my hope is, really. Let's yeah. see. Do we still have the mic over there? Yes. All right. Thanks for defending my mic time. <laughs> I'm a freshman, so I know my place, so, you know. <laughs> So anyway, after hearing this lecture, I'm sure all of us want to become investigative reporters and on the front line, but unfortunately not all of us can. You can, yeah. actually. We have to do our homework first. You can, yes, do your homework first, but it's a very good objective and it's a good goal. It's a very yes. noble profession. So while we're in the process of doing that, um, what are the little ways that we can combat this sort of prejudiced truth and really like focus on, or neutrality and focus on really the truth aspect. Well, I think living your own truth and understanding just by your question, it means you want to do something and you're concerned about this. So knowing that presumably here you have a friendly environment in which to, um, in which to operate. Um, and and, and it always has a ripple effect. You do what you can do. If each individual does what they can do, it has a big ripple effect. And then all those ripples join, and it makes a big wave. It really does. People need to understand that each and every one of us is empowered, and we can make change. On climate, we can, but on climate, it has to be governments and corporations. It can't just be us changing our light bulbs and turning off switches and driving electric cars. It has to be government. But on these other issues, all of us can do what we know is the right thing to do. And I would also say that, you know, I, 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 I think this is the time where I can bring up this idea of safe spaces and, um, on, on college campuses. This troubles me a lot, this stuff, because the way it's, the way it's sort of translated into, of course there have to be safe spaces where you can be safe as a, uh, in terms of your, 
your ethnicity, your religion, your sexual orientation, your gender, whatever it is, people have to know that no matter who they are, they're safe to be able to exist and to speak and to study and to and to and, and, and all of that. But the idea that you have to be safe from ideas that run counter to yours, or that you have to be mollycoddled into just being in an echo chamber, I mean it's just wildly wrong. And I hope that I hope that that I, I know that this university is you know doesn't fall into that trap. But I'm just so surprised by how if not at university, where? Where are you going to have the freedom to be able to explore even ideas that you don't like, even people that you might not na naturally gravitate towards, even movements or whatever? It's only here in this safe space that you can actually operate um, in areas that you are in conflict with or you don't understand or you think are, inf uh, or you think are offensive. And that's how you grow, and that's how you grow resilience, and that's how you grow intellectually, and that's how you find your way in the world. Because if you go out after four years of college, and then maybe grad school and whatever, and you've only been surrounded by people who believe what you do, who like to eat what you do, who talk like you do, you're going to get a real shock in the real world. And since my son is a freshman, even freshmen can go out there and <laughs> speak their so truth. So I think we have time for just two more short questions, please. There's one right over here. Uh, is that Laurie? No. Wait, no, she's back there. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for coming to URI, which is also my alma mater. Um, I'd like to know, what do you think happened to the news reporting around the 2016 election? How did all of the major networks miss the fact that Trump was going to win the election? What, what do you think happened? That's a good question. It's a very good question. Um, look, let's be serious. Even Trump didn't think he was going to win. <laughs> that's what he says. I mean, and that's what his family said. You could see how he came out. That's what most of his associates and people say, because he came out without a but victory Ke but speech. But Kellyanne Conway thought he would well, win Well, she it, did, yeah. Right? I mean, they're always true believers. But, um, <laughs> but it's a good question, and it's an appropriate question. Um, I think partly, obviously partly, because um, not enough emphasis is put on a more diverse uh, travel schedule around the rest of the country. I think that's one thing. Um, but I also think that we underestimated, and I'm sorry to say this, the willingness of the American people to go into the sanctity of the voting booth and to vote for somebody who denigrates foreigners, who makes fun of people with disabilities, who is rude about women, who has betrayed his vows to his wife, and who does all this stuff. Who thought that people would vote like that? What we didn't realize was the economic um, issues and the other. The, the majority of white women voted for President Trump. I find that interesting, and that's moving right now. And, and you know what we've discovered? It's a very good question you ask, because some demographics did actually put him over the top. The majority of white women in this country voted for President Trump. Why did they? Now, three years later, we find out, a lot of them did what their husbands do. Yes, sorry. <laughs> sorry, this is this, this is, these are the results of polls that have come out. Many of us have been studying and trying to figure out. However, I am not saying that he's illegitimate or what. He was elected. He was elected president of this country. And we do actually have to know why and what. And maybe he'll be re-elected. <laughs> maybe he will be, you know? Look, I mean, why not? If people vote the the economy and, and stuff like that. So there, all, there are also a lot of structural and institutional reasons that we were just didn't know. And we didn't, we didn't follow. I, I believe that we owe everybody a mea culpa, just like we did during, um, during the, the, the Iraq war. The New York Times, the Washington Post, many, um, many organizations spent a lot of time looking inward 
and saying, how do we get this so wrong? How could we have fallen into this trap of Saddam Hussein and weapons of, of, of mass destruction? They didn't exist. And journalists did the right thing, and organizations did the right thing. They investigated, they looked inwards, they did ombudsman um, reports, and they corrected and apologized, and now are very much aware of, of that failing. And I think the same has been happening with this. There's been a lot of self-flagellation, you know, a lot of this idea that, oh, we're just the elite and we don't know what's going to happen and this and that, and we're out of touch with the rest of the country. There might be a little bit of that, but I don't think that's the whole reason. Because I don't think, by and large, journalists who have been trained to be journalists, and, you know, most major news organizations, certainly newspapers anyway, and and, you know, have people all over the country. And there are many, many fantastic local news organizations. And I know this because I judge something called the Livingston Award for young journalists. And I get the most ph phenomenal entries from people all over the, the heartland as well as the coast. North, south, east, west, middle. And they're brilliant, brilliant works of journalism in every discipline. Newspaper, radio, television, online, everything. Um, Maybe sometimes, you know, I mean, there are institutional issues that we have to look at. I mean, what this gentleman asked me the question, how would you do it differently? I, I said, with more context, with more, you know, go, go and ask more people more questions. But I don't think we can deny um, the fact that you could win a presidential election even by openly and overtly giving voice to some, of the, to some of these policies, politics, issues that we have all been raised not to accept. We've been raised to be kind to our neighbors. We've been raised to be polite to women. We've been raised, raised to be faithful to our partners. We've been raised to treat anybody with disabilities or differences with respect. What can I tell you? We have time for one last question, and I see one right over there, right there. Thank you. Make it quick. Uh, thank you for coming here, Christian. My name is Babak. I'm also Persian. Uh, my question is, if you were the head of a foundation, um, how, what would you do to help the plight of the journalists? Sorry, to help what? If you were the head of a foundation, what would you do to help the plight of the journalists? Plight of the, well, we've talked a lot about safety and the, other, and the other issues, but I think the issue that this lady just brought up lastly is something that I've been thinking a lot about. And I would help, I would try, and other people are talking about it too, Malcolm Gladwell in his latest book, and I think he often has a, a really interesting finger on the pulse, and he gets to the heart of, of a lot of these issues that we're grappling with as a, as a society. And I think I would try to reorganize the, the, the sort of the commons, if you like, the public sphere, to try to, try to let people understand and know that we must all be open to people of other and differing political views. Not just cultural, religious, and that, because that we kind of got. But I actually mean political, economic, you know, obviously the, the, the immigrant situation as well. But I think that we, we are too trained these days perhaps by force of the way the media is organized, perhaps by force of social media. We're all too trained to stick with our own tribe, whatever that tribe might be, instead of being, all, being open and seeking those with different ideas. And I do think that is, that is very important, um, which is not to say that we might come to different decisions or sh radically shift our world views, but we have to know particularly as journalists, it's our duty to know. And that's where I put a lot of current effort. I do think so. Well, Christian, I can't begin to describe how...
Thank you for coming. We are so honored and privileged to have you here. I know we had a lot of stiff competition between Brad Pitt and the Foreign Minister of Iran, <laughs> but as a proud University of Rhode Island graduate and Harrington School graduate, uh, I think you've exceeded all of our expectations Thank you. here this Thank evening. You. And, and we have a little gift for you as well, same time. Where's my gift? Pe right. People often ask me who I would like to interview. Well, I've been trying for three years to interview President Trump, so anything you can do for me, we have a certificate got any to, commem to commemorate this occasion today. Thank you. And also a small token of our appreciation from us and from the URI Foundation. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Is that a scarf? It's a scarf. <laughs> Thank you.